this juxtaposition of cultures, of landscapes, and I think locating Pisco in all of that is really uh, important instead of saying like, oh, this came from, you know, Europe, Greece, whatever. Like, no, there's way more details to dive into. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Decoding Cocktails podcast. I'm your host, Chris LeBeau. At the ripe age of 38, I left my former career behind and joined the hospitality industry. Since then, I've been on a rapid journey of learning, meeting all sorts of great people, and this, this podcast, is my chance to bring you along with me. Whether I'm interviewing somebody that works in the industry, another enthusiast, or occasionally stepping back to share what I'm working on or my thoughts. I'm so glad you're here. And so with that aside, let's get into today's episode. What's happening, everybody? This is Chris with Decoding Cocktails. Thanks so much for tuning back in for another episode. I am pleased today to present uh, Cami Kenna. Uh, she hails from Portland, Oregon. Uh, for a while, after winning a bartending competition, ended up calling Peru home, uh, but now lives in Oaxaca in Mexico. Uh, in Oaxaca, she worked with a group called Experience Agave that provides a lot of tequila and mezcal tours, but we got together to talk about her other gig, overseeing sales and marketing for the company Piscologia. Um, first of all, uh, as Cami will break down, the term Piscologia essentially means Piscology, the study of Pisco, um, and her, the company she works for is also a women-owned and uh, produced product. Uh, in a way, I think Pisco is a victim of its own success. And what I mean by that is that the Pisco Sour is a drink that if you have experience, for most people, it is just, it can be such a revelatory delight that we begin to think of Pisco as only belonging in a Pisco Sour. And you'll hear a lot of parallels to agave in this conversation where I think for a long time, the margarita uh, dominated the agave category and where we didn't see tequila as something beyond that for other cocktails or just to be sipped and enjoyed on its own. Um, Cami will get into the details on this, but Pisco is a grape-based brandy um, that comes from either Peru or Chile. And what we need to keep in mind about this is, you know, for those out there anointed in the wine world at all, you can have two Chardonnays that taste quite different from each other based on the region they were grown in, how they were fermented and treated. So these things don't always equal what comes out on the other end. So we can see Pisco and immediately think, oh, this belongs in a Pisco sour, but this could be a completely different flavor of grape, how it was treated. These things can ultimately dictate what the flavor of that ends up feeling like in in the long run. Um, and so with that, one of the things that people like Cami are hoping to capitalize on is with the rise of agave's popularity in the country, with us now beginning to look at these things as beyond um, the margarita, but really these things that people are chasing mezcal in these very in-depth ways right now, uh, she's hoping that we can begin to look at this the same way we look at mezcal or the same way we look at vintages of wine. Oh, 93 wasn't such a great year, but 94 was an amazing year. Um, and so things to think about that, uh, as she will allude to in the conversation, we don't always want this to taste the same. That's what really defines vintages. Um, also important to highlight that, uh, if you look at the history of cocktails in this country, uh, San Francisco was one of the big cities and Pisco in the form of the Pisco, uh, sour and Pisco punch were huge at the front end of this. And so that in part comes to pass through things like mining uh, and, and the gold rush in California as people migrated to that area. An important note, uh, Cami and I were supposed to have this conversation in Brooklyn where we did, but um, it was at the very beginning of the conference and we were having trouble finding each other. And so uh, when we finally did, we were catching up in front of her booth and uh, having a great conversation. And suddenly I was like, oh, this is, this is the conversation right now. So I turned on the recorders. I never really got the mic set. You're going to hear plenty of ambient noise, which overall is good white noise, I think. But occasionally you'll pick up other little voices in the conversation. Uh, there's a 
another Pisco uh, uh, promoter and brand called Suyo. His name is Alex. Alex was listening in on the early part of our conversation, so at one point you'll hear him jump in. Also important to know, uh, you're going to hear Cammy and I, uh, uh, after a while, kind of say like, hey, thanks for chatting. You'll hear some music, and then she's going to come back because we actually recorded this in two different sessions. Again, it was all very impulsive. She is a fountain of knowledge, and so I think you're really going to enjoy hearing what she has to say. Uh, more writing on this and links will be available on my Substack page at decodingcocktails.substack.com. And if you're a Pisco geek, uh, during the heart of lockdown, when small brands were trying to figure out what do we do, uh, Cami worked with some people to create a free Pisco certificate, which is at PiscoCertificate.com. Uh, keep up with Cami at K-A-M-I-K-E-N-N-A on Instagram. And you can find Pisco Logia, P-I-S-C-O-L-O-G-I-A, Pisco. So Pisco Logia Pisco on Instagram. Again, there'll be links to both of those in the show notes. So enjoy my conversation with Cami. Give me this favor here. Um, so start us from the top a little bit in terms of like, so obviously, so, so what is Pisco in general? It's uh, it's made in Chile and Peru. Yeah. They love to have fun conversations about, about yeah, if you think that uh, conversations about uh, American barbecue, other things get heated uh, in Pisco, uh, in uh, Peru and Chile, it's it's a for real yeah. conversation. But tell us a little about what Pisco is um, and tell us specifically about some of these Peruvian brands we have right here, or, or varietals we have here. Yeah, so Pisco is a grape distillate from the western parts, the western coast of South America. So there's grape distillates uh, in, for sure, obviously, Peru with Pisco, Bolivia with Singani, Chile with Pisco, and there's also some grape distillates in Argentina. I'm sure in other countries also. It's a natural progression. Yep. And it's always been a natural progression. The spirit has always been made because grapes arrived... 15, between, somewhere between 1539 and 1541 to Lima, Peru. The first wines were made from them in Lima in 1551. So very early on, wines were being made. Yep. And it's a very hot part of the world, a warm part of the world, so the wines needed to be fortified. So naturally, you distill some of the wines and you fortify your wine with uh, the distillate at that time, it's aguardiente, aguardiente de uva, uh, fire water, uh, brandy. And so that made them somewhat shelf stable to be able to travel long distances, which in South America they're long distances, and get on ships, travel up, um, and out of the ports uh, eventually. So there was always some form of distillation of wines happening for the wines that were being made. Do I remember, Cami, that um, the wines began to be, ex- they were being exported to Spain, and they started, the crown started putting a lot of taxes on it to protect Spanish, and so they were like, well, all this is going to go bad, yeah. and so that at least was part of the, because I think like also the same was true in Martinique when they were, they were making their rum from molasses, yeah. and then the crowns, or France started taxing, and so they were like, well, shit, like, we got to use all this sugar cane now. Okay, anyway, so, so that is... Same idea. Okay. Exact, it, that scenario is common all throughout yes. uh, the Americas because of whiskey, Spanish colonization. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think all Yeah, whiskey the, north. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that, because there was already a practice of distillation, that is what turned the corner and created these great spirits. So, Pisco, Singani, Pisco, and I, in, in Argentina, there's other ones. So... Yeah, because of the outlawing of wines, they turned more to preserving them because obviously distillation is a way of preserving your, it's capturing the spirit of the wine before it goes to vinegar and you've got something shelf stable. So that's kind of the evolution of that. And it was always aguardiente de uva. And when it was popular uh, from the gold rush in uh, California, so in the mid 19th century, Everyone's migrating over to California for the gold rush. And from all around the world, people are traveling.
traveling from the Atlantic, they have to cross the Strait of Magellan. They need to stop at this port, curiously, on the west coast of Peru, uh, to stock up on supplies. So they're bringing tropical fruits, they're bringing uh, the spirit, they're bringing all sorts of supplies, restocking from that journey to continue on to the north of uh, California. Right. And they start bringing this aguardiente de uva de pisco. Aguardiente de uva de pisco. That's a mouthful. It's pisco. It becomes pisco. And so that's kind of the evolution of how it goes from wine, fortified wine, to aguardiente de uva de pisco to pisco. It's all of these stages. Right. Um, and from there also, I think as I read too, what you know, whether it was people traveling from Europe or Peruvians themselves, when... Pisco then shows up in San Francisco, you know, and it's funny, uh, uh, standing stand next to Alex from from Suyo as well, uh, he was saying, you know, it's like, you know, the Pisco Sour has almost begun to overshadow the category in a way where it is an, a truly delightful cocktail, but it's like people, but people see Pisco and they think Pisco Sour and that's the end of it. But anyways, but it arriving in San Francisco at that point in time really helped also bring it in like our early cocktail golden age as people say and pisco caught on in california yeah exactly and that was with the pisco punch and that was at the end of the 19th century and that is a really fascinating for me that's the most fascinating drink because i think there's a lot of parallels because this is what i want to do is draw parallels between pisco and agave spirits in mexico so the margarita is also like uh popularized around the same time period because people are traveling to Tijuana and they start ordering the margarita is one of the theories. Right. And so you have this pre-prohibition I think the margarita is like the most consumed cocktail in this country. So you have this pre-prohibition kind of history to it but we have that with Pisco also. And in fact the the cocktail is what popularized the spirit and then obviously prohibition knocks everything out Right. and it's struggled to recuperate ever since so the cocktail is so cool because those pineapples coming up from Peru pineapples are from the uh, the Amazon from uh, Peru from South America from the area so they get loaded up on the ship with the pisco they come up to Port of San Francisco a bartender Duncan Nickel plucks the pineapple plucks the pisco and he creates the pisco punch but he had a really cool secret ingredient that was with a um, coca leaf macerated Bordeaux wine that went into the drink. And so this recipe has been lost. There's been a lot of study to try and recover it in the San Francisco area, but uh, it, it has come out that it, there was a coca leaf wine macerate that extracted, because of the alcohol, it extracted a cocaine alkaloid. Not the drug, but the alkaloid that they make the drug or they concentrate the drug on but it does make you a little loopy so people were stoked on that drink for more than one reason <laughs> yes the pisco but also the the secret ingredient i'm ready to mine let's go yeah i know and actually so i moved to peru in 2015 and i went to work at a couple of different bars one of them was the museo del pisco and there they have an incredible cocktail program of tons of different piscos from all over Peru. And with them, I made their pineapple gum syrup recipe for the pisco punch with coca leaf in it. Because coca leaf isn't, it, it's only legal in Peru and Bolivia, which is a travesty because it's actually like used for altitude sickness. It's a daily sort of like sure. medicinal herb. So it's outrageous that it's illegal but so it's still used in, in all sorts of applications still used in peaceful punch but not combined with sometimes it's combined with alcohol actually they do uh, uh, coca leaf macerations behind the bar so I didn't know if it was the altitude or the coca leaf that got me feeling a little crazy in Crisco but <laughs> <laughs> the coca leaf was also in the original recipe around the same time as coca cola right so, right so that is a time period where it's being used in a lot of places until it is prohibited to be used in food applications. And I don't know what year they made it like an actual like substance that cannot be uh, that's illegal all across the world. Um, but that's what popularized the cocktail and um, the spirit in San Francisco and during that time period. And it's 
struggled to recuperate ever since. So my goal, and actually there's uh, Caravelo and uh, Glendon are going to be making cocktail, like Pisco Punch cocktails, because the whole, I think we're all kind of of the same mindset that it's like, yeah, Pisco Sour, cool, but there's also the Pisco Punch. There's the Capitan, which is a Pisco Manhattan, yep. which I just made. I'll show you pictures. photographer. She's come to Peru. Uh, she's also Hi, one of my oldest friends who happens to be a really talented photographer. We're about to see some really cool photos that you guys can't see, but yeah. I'll, I'll describe them in vivid detail. Yeah, so we made, <laughs> a, I made a couple variations on the Pisco Punch and she took gorgeous photos of them. So this one is, no, sorry. This is a Pisco Punch Jungle Bird mashup. Okay. So kind of modernizing in a, in a way, like trying to get that sort of like outlaw spirit back of the original into today's version because yep. that coca leaf is like herbal and you have a wine, so it's like you need an aromatized wine to add to the Pisco Punch. And so this actually has an Amaro in it. Okay. And then we did, I sour the Capitan. So the Capitan is like a Pisco Manhattan. Sure. And then I threw it in with lime, um, egg white, yeah. bitters, all mixed together, and it is delicious. Uh, I forgot that I didn't have my um, pictures out. No, no worries. So in general, R refresh me, and I, I did my homework, and now I don't have my notes in front of me, and that's fine. Uh, yeah, we're so, spontaneous. Yeah, that's right. We're being very spontaneous, guys. Uh, but <laughs> so... Cammy, the, the number of types of, of grapes yeah. that, that can be used in Peru are how many? Eight. That's what I thought. Okay, eight varietals. Yeah. And yeah, what people need to think about is the, the way that when we look when we look at Pisco, sure, maybe it all is clear, it's unaged. Yeah. But what we have to think about is that you're using, you know, we don't look at a, a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Chardonnay in the same way. And no. so... Even if all these distillates are coming out of the still clear, we are starting with this wide pantheon of grapes, which ultimately creates this idea that, like, yeah, of course they don't all go well in Pisco Sour. Like, you can eat your steak with Chardonnay if you want to, yeah. but that's not what we're typically going to recommend for a pairing because yeah. what we're starting with, where it was grown, uh, these things are going to play huge into how the flavor comes out. Absolutely. Production methods. Um Absolutely, and I advocate for that, which is why, like I was saying before, if I go to a bar, they're using Pisco, which Pisco, one right. bottle, one right. bottle is not going to be suitable for every uh, Pisco cocktail or every cocktail recipe that you want to make. Right. You can taste it and then decide where it needs to go from there. So yeah, I would say the Uvina grape, when it's distilled into Pisco, has a lot of like olive and savory notes. So I've never tried it in a Pisco Sour. Other people say it's delicious. I would probably put it more in the Capitan or like the Manhattan realm. But it, it all begs experimentation. For example, there's other Moyad that I've tried that for me aren't, aren't as good as hers. First of all, Nati, my partner, is an incredible distiller. In 2021, she was deemed a female craft distiller of the year for all spirits by Craft Spirits Berlin. She's an amazing distiller. So what she's creating is kind of like she she puts her fingerprint on it, right? And her fingerprint is delicious. So you have the grace, but then you have all this methodology that kind of changes the outcome. So it's, I like to think of distilling and producing as like working on a soundboard. Okay. Every little kind of like move you make on the soundboard is going to change like minor, uh, minor, uh, minor, uh, Soundboard movements can create large output sure. changes. So that is how I think about um, production also. So she's using a Calienta Vino, a wine warmer. He is not. How does it make that? How does it make these things different? So, yeah, because in, in traditional wine country, we're very much interested in the growers or the or, or the vintners process in terms of like, why did you pick this hillside instead of this valley? Why did you crush these with a, a hand crank as opposed to, and all these things are multiplying yeah. when you start compounding them at that exactly. point. Exactly, and that's why, so, I, there's not a lot of representation. 
representation from the south part, the southern part of the DO uh, for Peru. And in that region, they do a lot of uh, fermentation in tinacas, which are earthen vessels that were created, that were made by uh, potters uh, that were there in the region. They're long gone by now. No one's making these anymore. Sure. But they all have maker's mark stamps on them from the 1600s, from the 1700s, from the 1800s, and they still ferment in those today. How does that not change flavor? It does. Right. So stuff from the south of the D.O. is really small. It often doesn't even make it to Lima, let alone outside of the country. So there's a lot of movement that needs to happen, a lot of interest that needs to grow in the category so that we can like muscle up some of those things. So because we were talking earlier about the like the agave craze that we're in the yeah. middle of right now, which obviously has its pros and cons and things we have to we have to be careful about. But that demand for mezcal is what's enabling us to bring these things from very yes. small batch producers in the lost in the, the hills of Mexico. Yes. There's the demand to bring that because like it's, it would be expensive for someone to scale up that operation and bring that product to the market. Or even once it gets to the United States. It can't just sit here. And if my uh, broker or my distributor tell me, like, no, we're not going to sell that. That's too obscure. I can't sell it. So right. I have to educate, build interest, educate, talk, talk, talk my brains out, which I definitely do. Which, <laughs> which she's proving she's good at right now. So. I like to talk about Pisco, about spirits. Um, yeah, there's really fascinating uh, depth of flavors throughout Peru, and I'm on a mission to bring them here and make everyone try them. It's a crazy dream. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and and she's 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 hell bent on educating you about pisco while living in Oaxaca. So uh, I know, but I spend a fair amount of time in New York, and when I'm here, I pedal to the metal and I'm just sure. like do everything I can to promote. Yesterday we did a training. I did a training at Lama Inn with their staff. And obviously this uh, event is amazing for us to be able to network and just get um, ourselves out there. And yeah, living in Oaxaca goes, uh, fortunately I get to do a lot of my work online with Pisco Logia, but there really isn't anything like face-to-face -face time. So sure. I definitely would love to be in New York or somewhere in the U.S. to be able to work on it, but from Oaxaca, we do have a Pisco certificate course um, because during the pandemic, we were all restless. My partners and I, like, what can we do? And we just were thinking, you know, this is the most important aspect of all of this is education. If people know more, they'll be more interested. They'll drink more. They'll buy more. We can bring small producers' products up. It's all a cycle, right? And so. Um, we created the Pisco Certificate course. The three owners, uh, myself, Meg McFarland, who's the founder of Pisco Logia, and Nati Gordillo, who's the distiller, the vigneron. Um, she does everything <laughs> and makes this product legendary. Um, and then we worked with a bartender, a female bartender in Lima. And then since, we've had a couple of educators and, and academics and even the ambassador to Europe for Pisco, or for Peru, um, and Pisco, add videos onto the course because they're like, hey, we need to talk about this. Right. And so it's sort of like an open source education platform, and it's all free, so it's fully accessible. Okay. Um, and you can get certified in Pisco. And the whole idea was to educate our um, distributors around the world because we can't touch everyone. Um, and there's always sort of like, there's various breakdowns in any supply chain and so to strengthen education around that really pivotal one was our idea. What it's turned into is that there's sommeliers, um, there's lots of bartenders, Lama Inn is using it for their training for all of their staff. Um, it's available in Spanish and English so people in Peru, people in Spain have taken the course. It's really turned into sort of like a global um, platform which we were hoping for sure. in a way, like for our distribution network, but it's turned into something bigger something and that's bigger. really exciting. I've been invited to, because some people have audited or like taken our course, I've been invited to take their course 
So actually when I get home to Oaxaca, I'm doing level two of the Agave Spirits Institute um, mezcal certification. So it really is about education, period. Yeah. And Pisco Lokia is Piscology, the study of Pisco. Okay. And yep. as a group, I'm a longtime bartender. I now have a master's degree in food studies with a focus on uh, Latin American spirits and obviously Pisco. <laughs> and um, Nathi is a sommelier. She's a master distiller, blender, grape grower. And Meg is a, her and her husband created, built from scratch, a winery in Apurimac, which is right next to Cusco. It's one of the highest wineries in the world. Okay. So the three of us are also like all the genius. Right, 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 right. <laughs> we, I don't know, it was synergetic how we all met, honestly. So here's a question that I, I know you got other things to do, but so, you know, if someone happens to have a bottle of Pisco at home, yeah. I would imagine there's a good chance it's plotted down a, 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 a fairly traditional path that uh, so I guess I'm curious like if someone wants to begin getting a little playful in terms of picking something else up and maybe it's also tracking it down at their at their local cocktail bar that has more than one bottle yeah. but I guess in terms of like hey if you're got, got a little budget right now what, what how would you recommend kind of a flight of like if you're gonna buy one bottle buy this but if you're gonna buy I, I guess for someone who wants to begin Picking up a survey of what Pisco can be, how would you begin to dive in? Yeah, I think that because I'm a little or a lot OCD, I would recommend going like deep diving down one grape. And okay. I actually recommend this for agaves also, like to do a deep dive study on, okay, I've got a quebranta from this brand, I've got a quebranta from Suyo, I've got a quebranta from each of the other brands, and I'm going to study them and see how they work in the cocktails I like to make. Okay. I'm going to taste them, sip them, and then move on to the next grape. That isn't at all how anyone has to do it. Like I said, I just hyper-focus on things, So, and I've done that with agaves before, and as a result, I've been able to like create my mental vocabulary okay. and sort of like know like really get to know Quebranta or really get to know we did a super deep dive on Arroqueños in Oaxaca and went to all these different villages trying it that that experience will never leave my brain okay. I do a lot of blind tasting also and I can pick Arroqueño out of anywhere Quebranta also so I think deep diving in on each grape seeing how they work in cocktails and if you want to skip that step too you can go to the plethora of blends. So Atolado is a blend of one aromatic or one less aromatic grape minimum, but it can be all eight of them, it depends. So that can be a really fun way to play with cocktails with different blends and see how different grapes kind of pop out of different blends. So You know what, no, I, 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 I mean, you're right. You, you can go either way, but I like that general direction of like, hey, if you're really into Chardonnays, yeah, like why exactly. not try two yeah. or three of them as opposed to like, well, you're into Chardonnay. Have a have a uh, a, a red Zinfandel, right? Uh, like, yeah, you're like, right. And, and so that that could be too much contrast in a yeah, way. So well, exactly. So okay. light out your quebrantas, light out your Italias, and then pay attention to the different regions. So there's five different regions. There's Lima, Ica, Arequipa, Moquegua, Tacna. And we'll link I to can, this. I can bet you they all have different terroirs. I can also bet you there's different production methods. So was it distilled in a copper pot still? Yep. Was it distilled in a falca? Was it fermented, open fermentation? Did it have closed fermentation? There's all of these things too that you can pay attention to and you can build those into your flights. Okay. Maybe you want to do all copper pots. Maybe you want to do all falca. Maybe you want to compare, you know, like you can mix and match by production methods once you're inside the great flight also. Yeah. So it's like, I'm telling you, we got to get nerdy here. That's it, people. <laughs> here we go. Um, <laughs> So, uh, it's Piscologia online, right? So, uh, so we'll, we'll link to this as well in show notes and everything like that. Is there any, I mean, there's, obviously, you're short on things to say on Pisco. Uh, yeah, but But uh, anything else that's top of mind right now you want to cover it all right now? Yeah, I think that uh, something that's really important, I, I brought up the Falca. The Falca is an old school uh, distiller that was created uh, during the colonial era, era, exactly when they came over. 
So if the grapes came uh, primarily from the Canary Islands and different parts of Spain, on their way out, they learned uh, distilling equipment from the Cape Verde Islands, where they're distilling grog, a sugarcane spirit, off the coast of Africa. So they see this distiller, they arrive in the Americas, and they build one of those distillers, and that is the Falca. So it's a really different setup. It doesn't have the swan neck like we're used to for a copper pot still or a cognac still. So what it has is a, a pot, a flat top, and a long like cannon that the vapors go straight out of, and since it's enclosed in cold water, it condenses and creates a spirit. So they're two really different spirits. And Porton has one of three under the denomination of origin. So that's a really interesting uh, product to try and a really fascinating history, a history that is owed to ancestral knowledge of three continents. So Africa, Europe, and the Americas. So you have indigenous wisdom that knew um, terracing techniques for farming and could grow grapes in the second driest desert in the world. <laughs> the Europeans, I can guarantee you, did not show up there knowing this. And they copy technology from Africa. Also, uh, people from Africa came down to Peru, uh, were brought to Peru, and uh, so there's this mix of the three cultures. So the myth of like, Peace Coast Colonial, or or rum for that matter, agave is the only one that's endemic to the Americas. So yes, but how was that harnessed? It wasn't the, co the colonialists or whatever, it wasn't them. It was people who knew the land and who knew the technologies to carry it out. So I kind of like to switch the lens a little bit and think of it that way. Sure, like, because there could be the question of who brought the product, yeah, but... The plan. Yeah, yeah, the blends, but how did this end up becoming an industry in the first place? And it was people who understood how to try to work it in the land yeah. and whatnot. Yeah, and the land is, yeah, I'm not kidding you. Yes, it's the second driest desert in the world along the entire coast of Peru. So as you might think that it would be, oh, this tropical lush landscape because it's close to the equator. It's not. It's sand dunes. It looks like the moon. It's amazing. And then there's green valleys from fresh glacial waters that cut down from the Andes and to go to the ocean and they cut through and that's where the agricultural ag agriculture takes place. And there's a lot of agriculture in that whole swamp. It's not just grapes, there's all kinds of pitaya, uh, like dragon fruit, gra uh, beyond grapes, asparagus, all sorts of things. Peru is bountiful and it's this juxtaposition of cultures, of landscapes, and I think locating Pisco in all of that is really uh, important instead of saying like, oh, this came from, you know, Europe, grapes, whatever. Like, no, there's way more details to dive into. Thank you for this. Yeah. This, is, this is fun. This <laughs> is great. Thank you. This, I'm glad it, it happened and, and, in and that way. No, this is great. This is great. Um, cool. like I mean is there an overlap with like the agave craze does that make people more interested in like 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 unaged white spirits like in, in yeah. okay cool yeah For sure. that's what and that makes sense in terms of, like 
otherwise, like before, the conversation was primarily like it was a whiskey based conversation. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, well, that can be that cool. Why can't this be too? What don't yeah. I know? Yeah, and I think that essentially it was back in the day of obviously being from the U.S., but working and traveling in Mexico. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So basically, like, understanding that actually Blanco tequila is the most consumed in Mexico, where being from the U.S., it's like, but the extrañejos are the most expensive, so they must be the best. Correct. And it's like... No, that's not the case. Yep. It is. There's a really amazing analogy. So I do tequila tours in Mexico, and I visit uh, Carlos Camarena quite a bit. And every time I visit, I ask him to explain to my guests, like, can you tell us about your frame analogy? Okay. Yes. So the frame is, you have this photograph, this beautiful piece of artwork, let's call it. And that's the art. Yep. And when you move into lightly aging, then you're putting like a mat around yep. the, the artwork. Yep. And then you move into extra aging, like an añejo, and you're putting up uh, a nice like wood frame. And then you're moving to extra añejo aging, and you're putting up like this ornate, intense frame, which is beautiful. But it distracts from... The art. Yes. You don't go to the museum to look at frames. Yes. Essentially. So yeah. that's my favorite analogy from him. And it made me, a long time ago, starting to work in Agave Spirits, understand like, yeah, Blanco is what you want. Okay, so Agave Spirits are the most complex spirit coming right. off the still. Delicious. Yep. So if we're into Agave Spirits in a, a big market that is for mixing, cool, and for sipping, and now you have people that are just full-fledged, like, you know, connoisseurs about all the different brands, and they're aim they're moving a lot towards Blanco. Yes. That, and then Mezcal comes in. That paves the way for Mezcal. Yep. And for me, the nerdiness of Mezcal is what paves the way for Pisco. That's because great. there is the possibility to be nerdy about Pisco, yes. just like there is for Mezcal. So for me, when I go to bars, I'm like, oh, I see you have a Pisco cocktail. Like, what Pisco are you using? And there's one bottle of Pisco. Yep. I'm like, right. wait, wait, wait. Right. You don't have one bottle of Mezcal, I guarantee right. you. Right. You have Tepestate, you have Tobala, you have clay pot distilled, you have right. fermented in cuero, like in the in the leather or the cowhide. You have all of these things because that is fascinating to you and you've connected how those production methods change the end product. Yeah. And that's why they're on your back bar. Guess what? Here too. Yeah. And so that's kind of like where I'm like pushing a lot. And I think there's awesome room for it in our category because there isn't like you don't see Moyad, you don't see a lot of Toronto. Right. You'd never see Ubina, which is another really cool grape. You don't see these things. Why? Because people need to get nerdy about it and care. Right. And so that's kind of like what this is and what it's going to be. So this is last year I was at this table with the two bottles that you've seen before. This year it's expanded, next year it will be expanded. That's great. So working with other producers and other parts of the DO to tell the story of the terroir in Peru. Talk about the grapes. The grapes are so cool. Like, yep. I started with this project in 2015, it, although it's been a brand for sure. 13 years. Um, and I stepped in like, oh cool, quebranta, achalado, without understanding the history of these grapes. There's a really cool book, uh, The South America Wine Guide by Amanda Barnes. Okay. And she talks a lot about the Criolla grapes. And so what are the Criolla grapes? They're what have been developed and or been born on American soil. So born on American soil, grapes are from Europe, well, or from uh, the Middle East. Via Europe, they came to the Amer Americas. This is born in Peru. It doesn't exist outside of Peru. Okay. This is born in Peru. It doesn't exist outside of Peru. And historically, it was like, oh, it's like the Torontes, a, a grape in Argentina. Yes, but it's actually not. Similar, but it's not. And then there's a Torontel in Chile. Similar, but it's not. Because this okay. developed for several hundred years in Peru. Uh, on this, I just learned this, that the coast of Peru is the second driest desert in the world. And that's where all of these grapes grow. Really? That's different. 
then you're talking like the mountainous regions or valleys of Argentina, or yep. you're talking about uh, Spain. They're different. And if they came five, almost 500 years ago, this one came, and the Negra Criolla Lista Prieto, it's called in Spain, came, were the first two grapes to come over to the Americas, and they were planted in Lima, Peru. And so over the course of all these years, first of all, they had a ba- they crossed and had a baby okay. born in the 17th century. And then second of all, they've been like naturalizing or becoming criolla in Peru. So they're different. If we tried a mollar from here, I tried to find a mollar wine because I did a tasting yesterday exploring grapes in wine, fortified wine and pisco form just to understand because like I was saying, if we don't have all the grape varieties for pisco represented in export here, so you can't just buy like an uvina pisco or a, a muscatel is hard to find, but it's here. Um, so I did wine, and also uh, there's a really cool grape called albilla. Al- albilla. 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 It's one of the pisco grapes. Really? Yes. No way. Yes. That's cool. <laughs> yes, That's it is. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Let's nerd out. Yeah, and, and I think just in general, too, like, even amongst the conversation, still enough attention isn't paid to, like, the power of fermentation. But it's yes. like, we're all interested in, like, what's coming out of the still. Yeah. But, like, you think about the, the fermentation magic that we, I think, understand regarding wine, how different wines can be. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, like, very quickly, like, we start with a certain grape. It was grown in a different yeah. terroir. It was yeah. fermented a different way. But like, but I think just um, people for a long time it was like, I just need a blanco tequila. Yeah. I, but now to realize like there are these depths of flavor and to realize exactly. like the grape varietal, like where it was grown. I think it's just people people don't make that leap with distillates in the same way that I think they make yeah. with wine. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah. I think there is. I've been working with um, our distributor, who one of the reps, who's a wine guy. And so, like, trying to make analogies for him, I'm like, this is wine distilled once. Right. That's wild. That's yep. cool. And so, yeah, and I like to drink wine, but I've never studied wine. Sure, right. Uh, yep. So, yeah, and then I was just thinking, like, fiber, uh, fermentation with fibers, everyone, like, loves with tequila, right? Which I definitely do. Well, there's a maceration point with Pisco also, and every single producer here is going to do it differently. And they yeah. all have their reasons for doing it as such. And even Nati, Nati and Alfredo, they do it differently. Okay. And so that's cool. Let's try that. Let's see what the outcomes of those are, you know? Like, it shouldn't be a hate. And that's something that I preach a lot in Agave Spirits. is like you want each batch to taste different. Yep. That's the whole idea. Otherwise, you're going to drink the same thing forever for the rest of your life. Right. And some people are like, yeah. But I think there's a lot of people that are like, no, I want to know why it's different. Right. And so, really, that's what this is about. It's like, she uses a wine warmer, he doesn't. Why is that different? How is it done different in the final product? I don't know. Let's taste it, what, you know? What What is a wine warmer? A wine warmer is a technology brought over from Konya. And so, essentially, it's like a large uh, vessel okay. that holds the next batch that will go into the still. And so it's the same measure as the still. It's held up outside of the still. Usually it's kind of like suspended. I can show you a picture um, of ours. But essentially it holds the next back. So it pre-warms the wine that will go into the still. And the reason why that's so important with um, cognac or with pisco, I can speak on pisco, I can't speak on cognac. Sure. But you're working with wine and you have to stagger your fermentation. So if you have a fermentation that's like drying out very quickly, and the threat is if you don't get it distilled in time, it's going to turn to vinegar. So by pre-warming your wines, you're speeding up the distillation process. There's also commentary about uh, temperature change in the wine warmer that does uh, affect the flavor. I don't know how that works. That's something I would like to dive into. But essentially what it does, it's a, the wine warmer takes an extra like tube from the line arm or the swan, swan's neck and goes through the 
wine warmer. And as you're distilling this batch, the vapors are coming up and going through the swan's back and through the tubing inside the wine warmer. So it's basically, uh, it's basically like channeling existing energy. It's energy saving. So something really fascinating is this cross-pollination. So there's already cross-pollination from cognac and the wine warmer pool. Um, that technology is also used at a distillery in the highlands of Jalisco at Felipe Camarena's distillery. So he channels uh, from one of his distillations to preheat the next batch. So it's just kind of like thinking, and his is all about sustainability and like thinking about saving energy. And as you walk through the distillery with him, he talks about every energy saving like point throughout the distillery and that's one of them. And then another... Hey everybody, thanks for listening. The show notes for today's episode are available at decodingcocktails.com slash podcast. If you'd like to keep up with what we're working on, there are two great ways to do so. One, our short weekly newsletter, Cocktail Confidential, which you can sign up for at decodingcocktails.com slash newsletter. Or give us a follow on Instagram at Decoding Cocktails. If you think this podcast is great stuff, we'd love it if you'd subscribe or, of course, share an episode with a friend. The Decoding Cocktails podcast is produced by Chris Bay and myself. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon, and happy cocktailing.